Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the second of three press conferences at today's 235th meeting of the American Astronomical Society, coming to you live from Honolulu, Hawaii. I'm Rick Feinberg, AAS Press Officer, and the AAS Media Fellow, Tharani Kunchadi, is monitoring our webcast. Uh, a reminder, if you're on the webcast and you've got the uh, password so that journalists can ask questions, uh, please log into the chat and we'll take your questions after the briefing. Um, I want uh, to encourage everybody to uh, silence your cell phones or anything else you might be wearing or have in your pockets that beeps or rings. Um, there is a press release going out at uh, one o'clock. Tharani, I forgot to mention that to you, but in, in uh, 15 minutes there will be a release going out to the AAS press list from AIP. Um, and uh, there's just the one release uh, for this briefing. Uh, all right, so if this is your first press conference at a AAS meeting, um, I'd like to just let you know how it works. Um, I'll make a brief introduction and introduce all of the speakers who will then uh, give their remarks uh, one after the other, and then we'll take questions at the end so that we don't step on anybody's time allocation. Um, so this is a, an unusual briefing for a AAS meeting. Uh, most of our press conferences are about uh, new discoveries in astrophysics. Uh, this one's a little different, um, but it fits in very well with uh, what the American Astronomical Society does and is all about. Um, this one is uh, featuring speakers representing uh, the American Institute of Physics, which is a federation of scientific societies of which the American Astronomical Society, the AAS, is a part. Um, and the subject of the briefing today is not on science per se, but on scientists, and in particular, how to improve diversity, equity, and inclusion among the population of scientists who work in our disciplines, in physics and astronomy and related sciences. Uh, this, I'm not gonna, I don't wanna undercut <laughs> any of what the presenters are gonna say, but uh, I will just say from the AAS's perspective, um, it, it became very clear to us as a society within the last decade or so that um, as other societies and the scientific organizations had discovered, um, you, you get a lot better science if you have a more diverse group of people working in the field. And we've, uh, we've been promoting women in astronomy for 40 years, literally. Our Committee on the Status of Women in Astronomy started in 1979. We have several other diversity committees. We have one on the Committee on the Status of Minorities in Astronomy. Uh, we have another one on sexual and gender minorities in astronomy. Um, and a few years ago, uh, we realized that, that a big source of the problem of not having a more diverse astrophysical workforce is that we don't have a diverse student population. And uh, a number of studies have been done that showed that the graduate record exam, the GRE, that a lot of students take um, as part of their applications to graduate school um, was inherently discriminatory. It's one of these things you look at uh, you know, as in so many other things in society, if you look at them carefully uh, from multiple perspectives, you realize that, you know, you're, you're not going to get the right answer if you don't ask the right questions, uh, and there are going to be uh, systematic biases in any kind of test that you administer. So the AAS was one of the first scientific societies to, to recommend that we, uh, that graduate schools stop using the GRE, uh, because it was potentially doing more harm than good. So, uh, so I'm proud uh, as a member of the AAS and, and as a staff member uh, that our society is, you know, working hard to try to improve diversity among our population. And if you look at the young people, especially in uh, here at the meeting, you you see that you know it's a very different population than, for example, when I was in graduate school. Um, it's a lot more diverse, and we want to keep that trend going. So the American Institute of Physics has been working on its own projects. Uh, to do the same, and, and uh, hopefully the, these results will propagate through all of the member societies and other scientific societies too, who will see us as, as a good example. So the subject today, uh, I've entitled the briefing Team Up for Physics and Astronomy. Uh, Team Up is an acronym, uh, as is usually the case in, in anything astronomy related. It's somewhat tortured. <laughs> um, so I will say it once, and it is, uh, I gave the title, uh, I gave this title to uh, Michael Maloney for his, for his talk. It's called Team Up, the AIP, that's American Institute of Physics, National Task Force to Elevate African-American Representation in Undergraduate Physics and Astronomy. 
And the first speaker will be Michael Maloney, who is the CEO of the American Institute of Physics. He will be followed by two of the task force members, Jedida Eisler from Dartmouth College, is going to speak on, uh, let's see, the title of her, of her talk is Change Will Come If You Create It. And then Ed Birchinger from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, whose name I've seen associated with an, a number of these kinds of studies and who has served on at least one of our committees, of diversity committees at the AAS, Advancing Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in Our Community. And with that, I'll turn it over to Michael. All right, great, thank you, Rick. Uh, and uh, good afternoon, everybody, uh, aloha. <coughs> uh, I'm Michael Maloney, Chief Executive Officer of the American Institute of Physics, as Rick said, and I want to welcome you here today, for those of you who joined us here in the room in Honolulu uh, or uh, by webcast. Um, I want to thank you on behalf of AIP and then also our board of directors, and I want to acknowledge that David Helford, who's chair of the board of directors, is in the audience today. As Rick mentioned, AIP, we're a federation of professional member scientific societies uh, in the physical sciences. Uh, one of our 10 member societies, the American Astronomical Society, is hosting us today. And we're um, very honored uh, to be able to have this press conference at a member society meeting uh, here today. Uh, we're also an institute that supports uh, the physical sciences enterprise. Our mission at AIP is to advance, promote, and serve the physical sciences for the benefit of humanity. That's a, a large task, but one of the ways we go about doing that is by uh, carrying out statistical surveys of our community of scientists, something we've been doing at some level or another now for nearly eight decades. Those data allow us to understand our community in very deep and meaningful ways. In addition, uh, AIP is also a convener of our 10 member societies. We convene around big issues of importance to the broad spectrum of scientists, engineers, teachers, and students that make up our community of 123,000 members of our member societies. One of those convenings is the Liaison Committee on Underrepresented Minorities, or what we call LCIRM, another one of those uh, acronyms. Um, and uh, all of our 10 member societies participate in LCIRM, as well as the National Society of Black Physicists, the National Society of Hispanic Physicists, and the Society of Physics Students. Um, about two years or so ago, um, the LCIRM, uh, in looking at the data that we've been gathering on undergraduate physics and astronomy production, um, came to the conclusion uh, that Notwithstanding the fact that the overall numbers of physics uh, graduates, undergraduates, had doubled over about the last 10 years or so, um, African Americans had not realized a similar success in degree outcomes. Indeed, their numbers amongst the undergraduate community have remained stagnant and in some years declined over a 10, 15 year period or so. So two years ago, that led AIP to commission the report that we're launching today here at the AAAS meeting here in, in Hawaii. That is a report of a task force appointed to examine this persistent underrepresentation of African American undergraduate students in physics and astronomy. I will let uh, the task force members who are here this morning, uh, Ed and Jedida. Ed was one of the task force co chairs, and Jedida was a key task force member. I'll certainly allow them to present the findings. Uh, into how they and the entire uh, task force broke down this um, challenging task into five key areas of research findings and, and recommendations. But I do want to say this, I really think this is a groundbreaking report for a number of reasons. Um, I think when you listen to Ed and Jedida, you'll understand that what we tried to do with this report was really to uh, begin to apply rigorous social science research methods to understanding the dynamics of the persistent underrepresentation of African Americans. That is, as it should be, uh, of considerable concern to the physics and astronomy community. In general, AIP believes that multidimensional diversity within the physical sciences community is vitally important to the health and well being of the scientific enterprise. 
Better science results from greater diversity, fostering equity as a, and a sense of belonging for all who are part of our community requires coordinated action and change across a broad range of institutions. This is the task we are faced with today. At AIP, we are embracing our unique opportunity as a federation and as an institute uh, and our responsibility for advancing equity in our community. This team up report is an important and powerful step in accepting that responsibility and AIP is committed to convening our community uh, to develop enterprise-wide responses to the important recommendations that Ed and Jedido's task force have developed. Finally, I do want to thank the whole task force team, the members of our community of scientists who acted as peer reviews for the report in its draft form, uh, and also multiple members of the AIP staff team, some of whom are here with us today, who supported the task force forces work over the last two years or so. Uh, I finally also want to thank Research Corporation uh, for contributing uh, towards the cost of the activity, which was primarily supported by AI AIP funding. So without any further ado, I want to uh, hand over, and I think, Ed, you're going first? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. Uh, I'm Ed Birchinger from MIT, and I was a co-chair of the Team Up uh, Task Force. It was an incredible privilege to serve on this uh, committee, working for two years to understand the nature of the uh, underrepresentation of African Americans in undergraduate physics and astronomy. Thanks. <laughs> I'll lower it back down when I'm finished. <laughs> I'm going to uh, give a, a, a brief overview of the uh, task force effort and the report, and uh, Jadida will speak more on the, some of the most important findings and methodologies that we, that we worked with. But I want to say something first about the composition of the body that uh, wrote this report. Uh, it was a dream team. Team Up is a dream team for social science contributions to the disciplines here of physics and astronomy. Um, our task force included researchers in social science whose careers have been devoted to understanding the lived experiences of African Americans in STEM. Our task force included African Americans in STEM, uh, some of whom had been physics and astronomy undergraduates and experiencing the uh, phenomena that we were studying. And we're all very deeply committed to equity and inclusion and uh, advancing the success of uh, minoritized students in, in physics and astronomy. We all brought our personal experience and deep commitment to this work. It was a, an amazing group uh, that sought to answer the key research question that's been on our minds, many of us for so long, some of us for our entire professional careers. Why are there so few black physicists and astronomers? Now to I'll put some numbers to that. Uh, physics and astronomy have, uh, for a long time, had among the lowest percentages of African Americans earning undergraduate degrees in their disciplines, really across the boards. Uh, for more than 20 years, that percentage has lingered at about 3% for physics and has recently risen to approach 2% for astronomy. Uh, much less than the representations overall, which are 9% for, for all degrees. Uh, what's more, during the last 20 years, uh, physics and astronomy have seen incredible growth overall in their numbers, much faster than those of uh, other disciplines, even in STEM. And that growth has been particularly strong for Hispanic Americans. We know that the reason why African Americans are not earning bachelor's degrees in physics and astronomy at the rates of other students is not because the students lack motivation, uh, intelligence, capacity, capability, any of those factors. What we found is that it has to do much more with the environments in which the students study and the environments provided by uh, the larger society in the US. Our interviews and site visits uh, confirmed that African-American students have the same drive, motivation, intellect, and capability to earn physics and astronomy degrees as students of other races. 
And indeed, notwithstanding the overall uh, poor numbers, there are a number of uh, colleges and universities that are really thriving and whose students are thriving and which can serve as exemplars to other places seeking to uh, alleviate and reverse this problem. And we found all of this by convening this uh, marvelous research team working for two years, I might add, with the strong assistance of the AIP Statistical Research Center. Very happy that Rachel Ivey is, is here, uh, having led that effort for a, a long time. What did we do? Well, we conducted uh, surveys of students um, reaching over 100 African-American undergraduates in physics and astronomy. We interviewed uh, 25 uh, black physics and astronomy students at a meeting of the National Society of Black Physicists. We uh, contacted physics and astronomy departments and got uh, information about the practices that they were following uh, from 40 departments. We conducted in-depth uh, site visits to five departments that are thriving and excelling. And we brought our own knowledge and that of the social science research literature uh, to bear on this uh, problem. I want to say at the outset that we were encouraged by the LCIRM, the Liaison Committee of Underrepresented Minorities of the AIP, to set a goal for the discipline, and we did. Our goal is that physics and astronomy should at least double the number of bachelor's degrees awarded to African Americans by 2030, and we think that that is achievable. Now, what is uh, different about this report from others? There's certainly been many diversity reports uh, over recent years, including uh, one discussed a year ago at the AAS meeting. Well, this was a comprehensive study of the student experience and the faculty and university role in uh, the development of physics and astronomy undergraduates. Uh, no such study like this had ever been done before in our profession. And in, this, in the way that we did it, we're not aware of a similar study in other fields uh, as well. We found that it's important to examine practices in a specific field because the environment that students face is in a specific field, a discipline and a department. And there's great variation across departments and fields, even at the same college. Our report is a little bit unusual in that we focus heavily on matters of culture. And we're pretty upfront that one of our uh, goals with recommendations is to transform the culture of physics and astronomy. That means uh, undertaking uh, a critical self-reflection on the values and norms of the profession. The report has an extensive research-based discussion and recommendations on change, on how to affect sustainable change. We don't want the report to merely uh, end up on a shelf and become dusty. We want it to become a real practical tool for people to uh, uh, create that kind of culture change that students and we are calling for. Indeed, the highest priority recommendations of the report are around change management. They're not around the mentoring practices that departments need. We know what those are. What we don't know is how to, or haven't shown effectively how to create sustainable, long-lasting change that uh, is reflected in sustainable uh, outcomes for students. Rather than closing a gap, we need to open a space for honest conversations in astronomy and physics about the financial and conceptual investments that are necessary to affect change. We have to change how we think about the problem before we can solve it. What did we find in the report? We found that the persistent underrepresentation of black Americans in undergraduate physics and astronomy is due to two main factors. The first is the lack of a supportive environment for these students in many departments. And the second is the enormous financial challenges facing both African American students individually and many of the departments that are most successful in supporting them, in supporting them to graduation. In short, the environment and money are the drivers. Our findings and most of the recommendations were organized around five factors that we found are most important for black student success in astronomy and physics. A sense of belonging, academic identity, by which we mean asking whether the students perceive themselves as physicists or astronomers in training, academic support, personal support, and leadership and structures. In addition, we provide five recommendations in change management 
and as I say, they are among the highest priorities. What are some of the major recommendations? Well, under change management, we're recommending that professional societies should work with physicists and astronomers to help them make sense of this and other reports. Our report is lengthy. I certainly encourage everyone to download the full report online at the AIP.org website. It's 180 pages, including all the appendices. The main body of the report is much shorter and more readable, but that's a lot to absorb. And when you add on that, the many other reports that have been coming out, such as the National Academy's report on sexual harassment uh, in academic uh, STEM, science, technology, and engineering, math, and medicine, it's a lot for teaching faculty or research faculty to absorb. And we think that the professional societies have an important role to convene groups to help make sense of, of these reports and to help foster a place where uh, scientists can think differently about their professions, including reassessment of the norms and values. Another major recommendation has, addresses the financial challenge that students and institutions face. And we're recommending that the uh, disciplines, perhaps through a new entity, should raise a $50 million fund, a $50 million fund to close the financial gap for black students and for those departments uh, where they best thrive. Is there anything else noteworthy about the report? Well, you'll read it and see, but uh, many of us are fond of the appendices which go into research details and throw in a couple of Easter eggs, uh, including a self-assessment rubric for departments and one for high school students and their parents choosing between colleges. And now it's my pleasure to uh, turn the podium over to Jedida Eisler of Dartmouth College. Thanks, Ed. Uh, thanks to everyone for coming. Um, I wanted to start out by thanking the students who were the center of our report. They were very definitely the centerpiece of what we did. They were ac actually the voice of, um, and they motivated and animated everything we found. So they are central. Um, they're one of the guiding principles was to have a student-centered framework. So I just want to thank the students that took the time and energy to share their experiences, um, which were both good and bad, um, but also present and honest, so I thank them for that. I also wanted to thank Arlene Knowles and Bo Hammer for being an incredible support staff at APS and for making this possible. Um, so the, the thing that I'm gonna focus on in my time, and I'm gonna try to um, stick with the time we have, is the students. Um, they are, I'm gonna reiterate what Ed said, that students had the same drive, motivation, intellect, and capability as any other student, um, and our core principles were around a strengths-based approach. We were not going to attack or accuse the students of being the problem. That was absolutely not, not part of our um, contention, uh, but that we were gonna find out what was of impacting the students as they were going through these experiences. Um, we also looked at the numbers of African-American students getting bachelor's degrees. We showed that there was a persistent underrepresentation, but that is sitting in the context of the fact that African-Americans are still getting um, more bachelor's degrees than they were, say, in 1995, I think is where we put our mark again. So it's not that students aren't going getting bachelor's degrees, it's that the number of them that are getting physics degrees is declining. And furthermore, the numbers in chemistry, the numbers in earth sciences, all of those numbers are rising, so African-American American students are still getting STEM degrees, they're just not getting physics degrees. So really the question is, how do we get African American students who are clearly interested in STEM, who clearly know that physics exists, how do we get them to come over and play in this particular playground? Uh, that's what we were trying to do, and we figured the best way to do that was to ask them themselves. They know what their experience is. They are the best arbiters of their own personal experience. And um, the other things we did in terms of building sort of notional or foundational notions were we made sure to interact with and be informed by social scientists. As Ed talked about, a number of us have lived the life of being an African American in physics and astronomy. A number of us have worked our careers in that. However, we're not credentialed social scientists, so we wanted to make sure to have folks on our team that could interpret the data, who could build our surveys, who could make sure that we had the rigor in the analysis that we needed, such that all of the original research that we provided um, is well supported and at industry standard. Um, as I said, we did a strengths-based approach. Um, that means we're assuming that these folks know what they're doing um, and they just need the right support um, and that the problems that we identified or the opportunities for growth that we identified were um, in fact systemic and not interpersonal. As Ed mentioned, there were um, five 
factors that we identified, he said them, I'll say them again. They are belonging, physics identity, or academic identity, academic support, personal support, and leadership and structures. For each one of those factors, we had four key findings and then four recommendations to support them. Uh, then we had another uh, row, if you look in our report, you'll see a beautiful table with it all summarized for you. Um, and on the bottom, we have not just recommendations, but interactional recommendations that are designed to foster um, interaction between constituents such that um, you get an even stronger impact. And then we have the change management, which as Ed said, gets into the actual sort of like behavioral science of how act actual change in systems needs to um, be uh, propagated. Uh, but I wanted to share some of the quotes from students. I thought that they, we as a, as a task force, uh, thought that they were incredibly um, insightful um, and nuanced in ways that you expect students who study physics to be. Um, these were taken at a, either at the NSVP or at, uh, during, in our surveys, and the students gave us permission to use them. So they are, they, we have, we've gotten that permission. So this is a quote that a student gave um, that we put under the belongings um, factor. So quote, there were certain times in class when the professor would pose a question and I would have the answer. Then another student in the class who was present and happened to be a white male would be like, no, that's not right. So I didn't propose my answer to the class. I was embarrassed because I was like, I'm just going to get it wrong, but ended up being right. Just things like that where your colleagues or other students around you just make me feel more doubtful. I'm trying to work around that and still have, a, uh, and still have confidence despite their opinions, end quote. Um, I chose that one in particular because if you ask African American students, that is ubiquitous in their experience. And the fact that they could point out that this is happening, that there is this counter conversation, right? The, the context is that the professor posed a physics question that ostensibly is just a physics question, um, but there is this sort of cultural normative interaction that's going on next to it, and the students are negotiating that and um, the classroom experience. And so um, the this, this student was talking about no negotiating that and having confidence, that sense of belonging, that sense of being able to produce similar input as everyone else in your class, that is a, a necessary, it's a key finding for how you're going to get these numbers of bachelor's degrees to increase. Because if you can get students to feel confident in their answers, they feel like they belong, belongingness helps them persist. Um, so uh, related to that, some of the key findings were that peers of the same race, ethnic, ethnicity, and gender provide valuable social and academic support, often through counter spaces, which itself is a whole area of literature if you're interested in that. It's things like family or church or um, black student organizations on campus that serve as refuges for the departmental cultures that may not be um, highly supportive of African American students. So that's a finding, right? That if you're in class and you're having these sort of high impact experience, a finding is having these counter spaces is a way that you can continue and maintain maintain uh, building confidence around your, yourself and your identity and your sense of belonging. Um, and also a key finding that we found was that microaggressions and discriminations received from peers diminished students' self-efficacy and persistence. So that's the, you saw that in that quote as well. The idea being that students who persist to bachelor's degrees, any students who persist to bachelor's degrees, are persisting through their experience, are persisting through the classroom experience, through the intellectual experience, through the social experience, uh, and through the systemic exper experience that they're dealing with. And what we're saying is, if you're having to go through microaggressions and, and discrimination through time, it's going to, um, in, it's going to wear on your desire to persist. Um, so our recommendation is that departments and faculty be, be aware that counter spaces exist, and when possible, point students to them or respect the space they exist around uh, when students are in, already in them, because many times students are in them in their faculty and chairs just don't know, and that's fine, but when you run up against that to sort of respect the counter space, that will help the student feel more like they belong and they will be more likely to persist. Um, another example of a quote from a student was um, sort of going the other direction because we have positive experiences too. So quote, there was one teacher that really honestly, I was going to give up on physics and she changed everything. I mean, she was so passionate about teaching. She knew a lot about physics education and research. She just kept checking in on me and she would make comments on my test like, this is not so good, come see me. Then she would email me like, did you see my comment? Come see me. <laughs> which I thought was great, the emphasis was mine. Um, but the idea that um, 
faculty that are engaged are much more likely to have students persist even when they're facing issues in a challenging major like physics. Uh, so some of our key findings were around the fact that the, mo the highest performing um, departments, those that have graduated higher numbers of African American undergraduates um, in physics and astronomy have communities that when you walk in, you feel them being welcoming and open, and there are multiple people checking on multiple students at a given time, uh, and multiple ways to get help and support. Uh, those are key findings that we saw in the high-performing um, environments, and most institutions, whether they are large or small, have support services that may be in the department or without that will support student uh, African-American students. Um, and so the recommendation then is to have faculty and chairs be aware of the support services on campus um, and to point their students to them, um, really all of their students, but certainly their African-American students to make sure that they're getting uh, the research, um, that uh, res the, the support they need um, all together. Um, when we talk about academic support, we're, uh, uh, sorry, um, we're talking about personal support. We're talking about the financial burden that African-American students are facing. Um, school is a rough time for everyone, but certainly for African-American students, and, and in particular, we're thinking about how we can keep students who have a demonstrated need to work financially compensated while sticking with their major. So we're asking folks to make sure that internships, programs, research, assistantships, any opportunities to, research, re to do research are paid uh, so that students can be both financially supported and also continuing to build their physics identity. Uh, so that was one of our recommendations as well. I could go on. I could for a very long time, um, but I won't. Just to say that our, our hope here was to really get a sense that it was embedded and imbued with the wisdom of the students for what we could do to make it better for them. We, we were talking uh, a little bit earlier about the question, um, well, why, why now? Why is this the time? Uh, and we think it's, well, generally we sort of feel that it has been the time. This is not new, um, but it is critical. And when you ask the students, they are, they are feeling these things now. And if we want to see these students go from um, students to bachelor degree holders, then we have to listen to them. We have to address their concerns and we have to do that now um, so that they will continue. They will tell other people that they should do it too and we will keep going. So um, this has been an issue for a long time. Many of us have been thinking about it for a long time, but if we can take this approach, we can learn from the students, we can hear them, and then we can do a major systemic intervention by creating this $50 million endowment, then we can provide actual financial support both to students and to institutions to make sure that we're actually getting the systemic structural problem solved and not blaming the students. Uh, it is not the students, it is the long-standing structural inequities that they're dealing with. So our hope is by um, providing targeted funding uh, to both students and institution, high performing institutions um, that we will be nipping that in the bud. And the other goal that we're interested in is making sure to double the number of physics and astronomy majors, uh, sorry, not majors, graduates, <laughs> bachelor's degree stamped, boom degree um, and by 2030. So, so right now that number is around 238. We're trying to get it up to 500 by 2030. Um, and we think if institutions, department chairs, uh, faculty, professional societies, all the way on up, we'll take the recommendations that we've put in here, um, that we can hit those numbers and may retain uh, the students that we have, uh, and also sort of accrete those from other STEM majors that would in be interested in STEM. Ah, one thing I meant to say at the beginning, uh, one of the findings that we found that th what I was saying there was supported, one of the findings that we found was that a lot of African American students started in college interested in STEM, but not necessarily interested in physics. And the ones that switched into physics did so because of positive interactions with faculty uh, and students. So it is possible for us to do that accretion, and it's important if we follow the sort of um, rules, and they're not rules, they're recommendations, um, that we put in our report, we think that that would be uh, much more possible. So um, I wanna be mindful of our time, but that's sort of uh, where we are with that ultimately you know, the students know they are interested, they're excited about physics, they know what they need, and it's really our job to do something about it. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Michael and Ed and Jedida. Um, so we'll take some questions from here in the room. Uh, if you're on the webcast uh, in the chat room, please queue up your questions for uh, Tharani and, and she'll relay them to us. 
and Larry Frum, uh, my counterpart at the AIP, will handle the mic here. So if you do have a question, raise your hand, uh, let me recognize you, and then make sure you tell us who you are and who you represent. I'm sorry, with African American uh, students that are unique to that population, or are these needs that you've simply you've identified are they more simply things that kind of are important across the board, whether it's a, a Hispanic student or <coughs> a, a Caucasian student, and that they just have not they're just not there right now that that we need to create those opportunities or are there sort of unique cultural uh, needs? That's a good question, and it's sort of a nuanced one, right? So in principle, um, belonging, physics identity, academic, personal support, uh, and leadership are all, they are ap applicable across the board. If you, do, if you do these things, it will benefit all students. Um, and we did find, so in our surveys, we focused in on African-American students, but we had respondents that, that Respondents that were also um, Latinx or or white students, right? So we had other, and I think Asian students as well. We had a number of different students reply, and we found that there were significant differences in some categories and not significant differences in others. It just sort of depends. All of the like nitty gritty is in our appendices. So if you really want to dig into that, it's there. But ultimately, you know, we we talked a lot about and are, are in, informed about the idea of intersectionality, so the, the fact that there are um, overlapping oppressions and identities um, does play a role in this, so we certainly um, see that there are specific issues that affect African Americans, um, and when, when you talk about African American cultural things, there are um, the kinds of cultural things I'm thinking about are things like stereotype threat um, that are being placed on students that they're having to negotiate that are very much identity-based and are intersectional in their identity, but they are still identity-based, that a, d a student of a different <coughs> identity may not face exactly the same thing. So we focused in as much as we could um, on the African-American student experience, but it is an intersectional framework, so we expect many of the best practices that we have here to apply uh, to students of other backgrounds. If I, I might, just, might just add um, one, a couple little things here. We, the survey of students that we did, um, as Jadida mentioned, did include students of all races, and it was analyzed to look for differences in responses across races, and there were very few areas of difference, um, but one of them was on the financial needs and hardship, which were greater for African American students than for those of other ethnicities, and that didn't surprise us because there is uh, national level data from the Federal Reserve Board which shows that the median wealth of black families in the U.S. is one-tenth, 10 percent, that of white families. Uh, so that hardship gets translated into student experience and it was reflected in our survey results. A second difference that came up in the survey was, um, I think, a very positive and more interesting one in some sense. It had to do with the uh, students' proclivity or desires for uh, improving their own community, um, what social scientists call pro-social behaviors. And we found that that was a uh, commonly reflected theme both in the student quotes and uh, in our site visits. And it's a lever that uh, we as faculty and institutions can use to uh, try to increase the um, attractiveness of our disciplines by showing how the uh, things that we learn in astronomy and physics can be applicable in many other disciplines. Okay. Uh, Ellis, I think, and we'll come to you for last. Hi, I'm Ellis Avalon with Astrobytes, and I was wondering how you guys selected your model institutions and if those institutions' practices were incorporated into your recommendations. Can I take that one? Okay. Um, as I mentioned, we did a survey of departments um, and uh, got responses from about 40 uh, departments on their practices. Of course, we also had, by department, degree outcomes 
um, since that's nationally available from the iPads database of the National Center for Education Statistics and from the AIP's own research on physics and astronomy um, graduates. So we had a sense of what the uh, promising departments would be and we wanted to span a diverse diversity of types of departments. So we have a, a flagship state university uh, major research, R1 university. We have uh, an a historically black uh, college. Uh, we have two uh, predominantly black institutions, um, both of them state schools, one of them a major state school, and so on, a smaller liberal arts focused institution. And we sought to get uh, the departments that in each of their mission classes were significantly outperforming uh, the averages. And then we were just very fortunate that the places that uh, we were most uh, drawn to uh, gave us the time uh, to, to visit and they shared with us their practices. Indeed, um, virtually all the recommendations that are department specific are being already um, upheld by the institutions that we visited. So we know that these recommendations are possible to implement. And we'll come to you from there. Thank you for a very informative talk. I know there's so much at this frontier of equity in our worlds and our fields right now. Um, so what comes to mind that I wanted to just inquire if you were familiar with is AIMS, the African Institute of Mathematical Science started by a gentleman up at Perimeter Institute who is from Africa with his father. They have now um, a program throughout most of the countries of Africa. They'll choose the best high school students in mathematics across countries and then give them a whole summer long of intense mathematical training and then send them off to the top universities around the world to get STEM training in different fields and then go back and whether it's in medicine or astronomy or whatever it is, kickstart those things in there. Uh, respective countries and so yeah, we're aware of it. Um, I will say, and it's an incredible work. I will say that the focus of the report was on African American students, and we did sort of specifically focus in on students of African descent from the U.S. And we wanted to do that because there is, is quite a bit of research about the experience of African students coming to uh, the U.S. to study that is different from African American students who are born here. So we are aware of the program, but it was outside the scope of our our report. I was just wondering about the mathematical side and the possibility of maybe instituting some because I know that tends to be one of the main things of really feeling comfortable with mathematics going into the physics and the astronomy, that it might be helpful to offer like a summer program between high school and, and university for African American students yeah. to give them that sense of that they sit in the class and they have the mathematical foundation. So th it's it's interesting when we were doing our first meetings, there was the question of, okay, so how do we elevate the number of African Americans in physics and astronomy? And we were trying to figure out where to put the line uh, because we weren't gonna be able to cover basically from birth to PhD for our students. So the question was, where do we draw the line? And we actually, we chose conscientiously um, once students hit college as the place where we were gonna start our research just because everything before that is important, um, but also hard to measure in the time that we had. So it's, it's an important set of, um, set of uh, preparations. And in fact, we know that any sort of post back bridge, those kinds of programs can be very helpful to students, but it was again outside of the scope of our, of our report. Pamela? Pamela Gay, uh, astronomy cast in daily space. I've seen some research indicating that students from lower economic backgrounds typically pick careers that have a higher job security rate and higher incomes. How much of that is impacting the decision of African American students to go into physics and astronomy, especially where there's basically no jobs in astronomy? Well, maybe I'll take, take that one because I've looked at that a little bit in our survey data. So there's actually, uh, I don't think you can generalize uh, too much here. There are, it's a complex set of issues that guide students into professions. Uh, the parental advice, the expectations of the community, of course, uh, financial needs are all among them. But roughly, we found um, a strong signal in our data, as I mentioned, for 
students wanting to pursue a career that would give back in some ways to their communities, not necessarily through a high financial payback. On the other hand, we are certainly aware that some students uh, elect to choose um, majors and aim for careers where there's a perception of a higher financial um, return. Um, a classic example of this is uh, computer science, which has shown uh, very large swings in the uh, enrollments of computer science over the last 25 years, up and down, currently on the upside, uh, largely driven by the economic cycle and the perceptions. This affects African American students as it does students of other races and ethnicities. We didn't have the opportunity to research students in, let's say, computer science or other disciplines. We were focusing on physics and astronomy. But we know that there is a tension that students face between the expectations of their family, their desires for financial gain, and so on. And our advice in our report is, to, is that departments uh, convey to students the value of training in physics and astronomy which we think is often underappreciated uh, by students. Um, even the financial uh, compensation of majors in those disciplines is, is quite good and uh, could be very competitive with, with computer science. But that's a story we have to tell better. I also wanted to sort of just jump in there to um, add a little nuance as well. So I think we have to be careful with some of the language. So um, low socioeconomic students are not necessarily all African-American students, nor, right? So, so starting there is, you have to tease that out. That's why I asked. Right, uh, so I wanted to just sort of state that explicitly. Uh, and then in addition, um, the, whether there are jobs in astronomy depends on what kind of jobs you're talking about, right? So a, n a number of students doing this sort of talking about this sort of wanting jobs that are are, are a, a social benefit. Um, students are going into teaching high school. They're working at museums, right? So it, when you're talking about no jobs in astronomy, there are, it, it's hard to obtain a faculty position in astronomy for sure. Um, but I think we have to, in many of the ways that we sort of advocate, advocated in the report, we have to be careful about over-prescribing what success looks like um, and who the success is determined to be for, right? So I think it's hard to answer that question in that way <laughs> um, without making assumptions that could be detrimental to students. There's a session, I don't remember what day or time, but you can search for it in the program, a session on um, what we call non-traditional careers in astronomy uh, because, in fact, uh, because of the problem you stated, Pamela, that you know, no jobs in astronomy, that generally applies to faculty research type positions. There are you know, 100 people apply for one position, so it, it feels like there are no jobs. Uh, but we're also seeing lots and lots of uh, astronomy PhDs getting very good jobs in data science, in, in teaching at, you know, at, at uh, community colleges or high schools, uh, working in science communication, um, you know, museums, planetariums, uh, public observatories, things like that. So, and, and transferring into other fields where there are more faculty positions, you know, whether it's a physics department or, or you know, uh, some other interdisciplinary field where uh, astronomy training is useful. So, yeah, th it, many, many, you know, it's like a big matrix. Yeah. There's all these different factors. But, but I just wanted to point out that there is a session on that very topic here at the meeting, as, as there tends to be from time to time because it's a you know it's on everybody's minds. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think uh, Ethan had a question. Larry, he's coming over here. No, no, try it anyway for the webcast. I don't know if they can hear you. Yet. Yeah, there you go. Okay. <laughs> it's it's on Ethan. Just yeah. Uh, Ethan Siegel, start to the bang in Forbes. Um, I, I really wanted to ask a follow-up on something you said about belonging. Yeah. You, know, you gave, a, I think, a very relatable example of a, uh, of a student who felt like their contributions were under this extra threat mm -hmm. from their peers in the classroom mm -hmm. because they would, you know, they knew the answer, mm -hmm. they would say the answer, mm -hmm. and yet it wouldn't just be the professor that they would be answering to, mm -hmm. but also their peers who would, you know, judge them mm -hmm. unfairly and not based on their merit. Mm -hmm. In, when, when I hear a story like that, I think immediately it's the professor's role and responsibility to step in and put the kibosh on that type of treatment. I think 
I think anyone who, who's experienced that knows that, boy, when it's you and 20 some odd people in the room who don't look like you telling you that you're wrong and the authority figure is not stepping in, that, that normalizes it, mm -hmm. that, that makes that acceptable behavior, even though it's grossly unacceptable behavior. Um, do you have sets of recommendations to, I would say, educate professors about what their role is in similar situations to that? Yeah. <laughs> uh, we do, we do, um, and and you're right on any number of fronts. I will start out. Let's let's get to the recommendations first. We absolutely have recommendations around things like setting up and establishing norms for the classroom, uh, because it is actually the professor's responsibility to man maintain a sense of whatever decorum is jointly established in the group. So we do explicitly recommend uh, that faculty and department chairs do explicitly state what the norms are going to be and then support those and then discourage behaviors that are counter to the norms that are agreed upon and explicitly stated. So for sure, that is absolutely 100% true. Um, and in terms of the extra thread and, and students having to negotiate all those things, there is an additional body of literature in uh, physics education research about, um, it's the responsibility of faculty to say, set up groups rather than letting students self-select because it helps to mitigate the sense of exclusion based on, oh, I don't wanna work with that person um, because I have a, a pre-existing basically racism or sexism or whatever um, that says that they're not gonna be as good as others, right? So we recommend that folks understand what the existing literature is because there's a bunch of work that's already been done on this to then carry out <laughs> the best practices around these ideas um, and then actively establish what the, pr the positive behaviors um, that should be being um, 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 uh, exercised in the classroom. Uh, and I just wanted to say, um, thank you for recognizing the quote. I, I use it for exactly that reason because anyone who has been through that will immediately recognize how difficult it is to think about physics mm -hmm. when you're also thinking about the people thinking about you and whether or not you can do physics. Um, and so it was sort of a, an Easter egg for students to let them know that we actually hear them because it is such, like there's just no way to, to, to do the processing of, you know, <clears throat> Y equals MX plus A. Uh, don't even, let me, let me not do that in public. Not on the mic, y'all didn't hear that. Um, to try to do Newton, Newtonian physics or something like that while also being established as a human. Uh, so that's exactly why we did that. Yes, we do have recommendations that support it. No, nothing in the chat. Okay. Just a real quick follow up to, to that question because I, I think that uh, it, it's, it's critical to, to address that issue of, of having a student, having students feel comfortable within their learning environment because that's when you can really facilitate a lot of progress. In the, sci in the science, how do we facilitate something that's critical to science, which is argumentation or disagreement, and facilitate those conversations um, and, and at the same time uh, ensure that, that there is a, a safe environment or that somebody is not going to, to feel that, oh, um, I spoke up, I said something, somebody disagreed with me over here and they said I was wrong. Um, that's what happens in, in science. And so where, I, I'm just curious, did you, do you have any thoughts on that? How do we achieve that balance? I'll, I'll give it a start, um, and then I'll ask my colleagues for support on this one, because this is not a topic that we really discussed in the context of the report. You're kind of alluding to the tension between uh, freedom of speech and expression and the valuing of, uh, of diversity and recognition of the social structures in which uh, people uh, work and study, learn. Um, I think each of us has uh, our own experiences and, and take on this. Um, I will say that the report does talk about the need for a critical uh, self-reflection on the norms and values of the profession, and that question would be naturally to fall within uh, that category. You know, what are the norms and expectations around discourse in astronomy? When is it appropriate to 
uh, to be challenging and, and questioning. Um, when, it is, when is it appropriate to, uh, to interject and say that was maybe an inappropriate way of uh, addressing someone? Um, these are not new issues for us. Um, there are certainly issues that have been of long-standing interest to the AAS with the establishment of its meeting code of conduct, for example, and the astronomy allies' uh, efforts. Um, so uh, I don't think I want to weigh in on behalf of the uh, committee for this, but I will certainly defer to my colleagues for uh, their opinions on, on this as well. Um, you know, it's an interesting question. I am a stickler for sort of details in this way, and so you know there there is a body of work that is questioning whether or not the particular kind of argumentation that we do in physics and astronomy and science writ large is actually beneficial to anyone, right? Whether that actually uh, privileges certain personality types and um, ways of being that aren't actually beneficial to everyone, and they're not. So what I mean by that is they're not neutral. They're not like sort of like equal for everyone and we just have to all do it. So I think there's some, some amount of conversation we need to have about um, if that is even the framework we want to continue. Um, the second point that I would make there is that, you know, people are pretty smart, right? And so you know the difference between someone saying, that's a wrong answer and you are wrong to be here. Right, I think we all have a sense of that, right? And so it's possible to re receive constructive criticism and know that it's not based on who you are, it's based on what you did. Um, so I think people have that ability. Now that's, that's a certain assumption on my part about the sort of like um, social acumen of any individual and I can accept that. Uh, but I, I do think it's important to recognize that like any dis disagreement isn't necessarily an affront to a, a person's identity. Um, and what we're saying is there is a difference between the sense of, like if we're working together and Ed has it wrong, let's go the other way, if we're working together and I have it wrong, if we have built a rapport and a relationship around mutual respect, when he tells me my answer is wrong, I, my ego will be a little hurt, but I'm not gonna assume it's because of me, right? And so I think a lot of it has to do with one, the frameworks like Ed said about like what is acceptable practice, two is what we assume is necessary to prove expertise, uh, and three is once relationship is built, it's much easier to have constructive criticism. And again, we go back to the sort of academic support with the role of faculty being present and active in the interactions in the classroom such that when it's time to say actually that's just wrong, no one is taking personal affront to that. Hannah? You, you've alluded to a number of recommendations that you've made and the need for cultural change. Cultural change doesn't come fast, it's really hard. Wish I could make your recommendations rules, we can't. <laughs> if every department implemented only one thing, from each of you, what is the one thing you would see implemented? <laughs> well, I, I'm uh, uh, chairing a session tomorrow afternoon where we're going to be discussing this very point, at, at least uh, uh, I certainly will in my presentation, so I've got a prepared answer for that. <laughs> and uh, my answer is that uh, departments need to have um, opportunities for everyone, faculty, staff, and students to come together and discuss in a constructive way what are their norms and values. They have to begin to make sense of their understandings of uh, the culture in the department, to acknowledge that there is a culture in the, in the department and to make sense of it. Um, that's, our, that's one of our recommendations, the top recommendation under the change management rubric. Oh, that's not fair. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> let's see. I am trying to figure out how I wanna frame it. I was looking for the number to give you. Um, you know, some of the base principles, the guiding principles that we set this uh, uh, task force and the report on uh, have to do with strengths-based strength -based approaches, uh, student-centered notions, and sort of an interdisciplinary uh, perspective. Uh, that's, those aren't recommendations, but they are guiding principles that allow us to get to recommendations that actually get to the problem, which is the culture um, and systems that students are engaging in. And so I think if there were one, I, as Ed said, I would, I would find a way to acknowledge that there are cultures. And the second thing is I would listen to students. I'd listen to the people that are saying there's a problem and assume that they're right. Um, I think you know the subtext in all of this for me is that um, students are saying there's a problem. They've been saying it for a really long time. I can tell you from my generation to generations before me, people have been saying it's a problem for a long time and people aren't listening. Uh, so the <coughs> recommendation is to listen um, and to listen to students 
would be that. So the whole thing. I just say from from AIP's perspective, I don't know. I could pick out one recommendation per se, but I know what our priority is, uh, which is really to act now as a catalyst for the community to begin to pursue the recommendations in the report, to be uh, the convener of our member societies and the larger community to figure out a way forward. So that's the priority that AIP is taking. Okay. Well. Uh our hour is up, and we do have another press conference coming up pretty soon, so I think I'll wrap it up here. Uh, I want to thank you all very much, um, not just for coming to the briefing, but for making the AAS meeting the venue for unveiling this very important report. Um, I, you know, uh, one of the, I didn't mention we, one of the other committees that we've established recently at the AAS is a uh, site visit committee, where the whole point is uh, to go to university astronomy departments and physics and astronomy departments and, and try to ascertain what is the departmental culture and, and then you know, be able to use that information to help create a better one that serves the goal of improving diversity, equity, inclusion. So you know, we're working on all fronts. I, I, I trust and hope that the AAS will be you know, one of your uh, very key partners in, as you roll out this report and roll out the implementation plan. Um, I, I myself have a whole bunch of questions that we've run out of time uh, for me to ask, so I look forward to talking with you about it during the rest of the week. Um, the next briefing is uh, in just a half hour at 2.15 p.m. Hawaiian time. Uh, it's a seminar for science writers, uh, so there's not going to be uh, great Hubble discoveries at this particular briefing. Uh, rather than looking back um, at HST's la uh, laurels, you know, it's coming up on its 30th anniversary in April, uh, we're going to be hearing from experts who work with the telescope about what it's going to be doing during its fourth decade. So if you want to know about uh, the future of Hubble Space Telescope science, please come back here uh, at 2.15. Um, and with that, I will thank uh, all of you for coming, and do keep your eye out for the press release from AIP uh, uh, that went out on the AAS press list, and uh, we'll see you again this afternoon. Thank you.